Hello, my name is Mary Rose, and welcome to the Billion Dollar Painting. Chances are the first work of art that will sell for one billion dollars is already out there. Today we're going to talk about Saint Praxidus by Johannes Vermeer, and we'll talk about one of the most enigmatic of the old masters, who has been a source of fascination, controversy, and even a great deal of forgery. Above all, we'll ask if Saint Praxidus could become the first painting to sell for one billion dollars. As always, you can find accompanying pictures and further reading for today's show on our website, BillionDollarPodcast.com. Many people have seen Johannes Vermeer's artwork without knowing much of his story, or even sometimes his name. His most famous work, The Girl with the Pearl Earring from 1665, is sometimes called The Dutch Mona Lisa. And there's something enigmatic about the girl as she turns her head to look over her shoulder, her mouth slightly open as if she's about to say something. But as enigmatic as she is, her creator is just as mysterious. The story of Johann Vermeer is interesting because the fame we give his name now is pretty recent. During his lifetime he was respected, yes, as we'll see, but never achieved the kind of lifetime fame we might associate with, say, Leonardo da Vinci. Johann Vermeer was born in 1632 and raised Calvinist by middle-class parents. His father held a number of jobs, both leasing an inn and later becoming an art dealer. This later career, the young Johannes would pick up and continue throughout his life. Johannes Vermeer married a Catholic girl named Catherino Bolenes, and her wealthy mother insisted that Vermeer convert to Catholicism before the wedding. Remember this detail, it'll be important later. Together, Vermeer and Katharina had 15 children, four of whom died before being baptized. While Vermeer himself converted to Catholicism, he was an artist at just the right time, because the Reformation and rise of Protestantism had led to a rise of secular patrons, which meant a booming business for all kinds of artists and craftspeople. This is part of what led to what we consider now the Dutch Golden Age, a period marked by such successful artists as Frans Hals, Jan Steen, and, yes, Johannes Vermeer. Many of these Dutch painters preferred painting the everyday lives of their Dutch patrons, in addition to the religious scenes that were expected from them. So you'll see a lot of interior domestic scenes, still-life paintings, portraits, and landscapes of cities in their artworks. Not a lot is known about the particulars of Vermeer's artistic career. We don't know who he apprenticed under, we don't have many records of sale, what we do have are records of his membership to the Guild of St. Luke, a guild for painters, which he joined in December of 1653. He was elected as the guild head four times, first in 1662, then again in 1663, 1670, and 1671, which suggests that even if he was not a famous man, he was at least respected by his contemporaries in Delft. Vermeer was still running his father's business, and so it's no stretch to suggest that Vermeer wasn't a particularly productive painter. Art historian John Michael Montius claimed that Peter von Ruyven was Vermeer's patron, and the fact that von Ruyven bought up most of Vermeer's artwork himself is to blame for the fact that Vermeer was not well known outside of his city of Delft. In one instance that we know of, a French diplomat named Balthazar de Monconius visited Vermeer in 1663, but found that Vermeer didn't have any completed artworks to show him. They had all been bought up by his patron. Vermeer painted sparingly, maybe three paintings a year, and almost entirely to order, which means that they were immediately snapped up and not exported outside the city to grow an international audience. Since I know I'm going to get an email about this, I'll address, briefly, his technique. Some art historians claim that Vermeer was an early user of the camera obscura, a device which used lenses and light to create almost a shadow box for the artist to trace. The idea that Vermeer used one of these devices was first proposed in the 1890s by American printmaker Joseph Pennell. A few other art historians have attempted to reconstruct this reality, but a major hurdle for this theory is that we don't have any of Vermeer's preparatory sketches for his paintings, and we don't have a camera obscura that we can link to him. What we do know about his technique is that he would poke a hole in part of the painting, near the center, whatever he wanted to be the focal point, and draw out his perspective lines radiating from that nail, using probably a piece of string tied to the nail. This can be seen in the left elbow of the woman in the piano lesson, where there remains a tiny hole in her sleeve. So, 
While many art historians mention the camera obscura in their treatment of Vermeer, there's more to his style than just that possible use of that, of that object. I tend to side with the art historian Arthur K. Wheelock Jr., who suggests that Vermeer, quote, must have admired certain effects of color, light, and focus in a camera obscura, but that he persistently departed from what he actually saw in the camera in his studio, or in another artist's work, in accord with his own highly refined aesthetic and expressive goals. More than that, I don't think that the camera obscura is really the reason why Vermeer is so famous today, but to understand why, we're going to have to go back to his story. In 1672, disaster struck the town of Delft when the French forces invaded the south of the Dutch Republic. Vermeer was conscripted into service as one of the civic guards, and his painting pretty much stopped. Even if he had tried to continue painting, the art market had utterly collapsed. He wouldn't even sell the established masters to his usual clients, there just wasn't money there anymore. He borrowed his own money from lenders to make ends meet, but even that wasn't enough to stop his family from sliding into bankruptcy. In 1675, at the age of 43, Vermeer died of a combination of brief illness and severe stress. He left Katharina with their 11 children to petition the lenders to forgive their debts, and she sold off any paintings that he had left in his home. And that was that for Johann Vermeer. An unremarkable life, to say the least. He's thought to have painted fewer than 50 works during his lifetime. He did not have any pupils. There was no school of Vermeer like you might have seen a school of Rembrandt, a school of Da Vinci, a school of Raphael, a school of Caravaggio, other artists that we talk about in this podcast. Over time, his name was forgotten. The reason we know Vermeer's name today is because of two men, the German art historian Gustav Friedrich Wagen and the French art critic Theophile Thore Buguer. They made a list of the essential works of the man they called the Sphinx of Delft because he was uh, so mysterious, and they published their essay in 1866. I can only find a French version online, but it'll be linked in the show notes as well if you want to flex some French muscles. In their essay, Wagen and Thierry Buguer called Vermeer one of the first masters of the whole Dutch school and made an effort to point to some 60 artworks that they believed to be by Vermeer's hand. I'll have a brief note about these paintings. Johann Vermeer's artwork is well known for being still, tranquil, with these elegant uses of light. The reason Wagen and Thierry Bruguer attributed so many paintings to Vermeer is that Vermeer's work is not actually very easy to distinguish from other Dutch artists of the time. There are dozens of interior paintings of these kind of petty bourgeoisie households with these soft, diffuse lighting and poignant vignettes that all look pretty much the same. And I say the same, not the same except for the trained eye, because as we'll see, even people with trained eyes can sometimes not tell which painting is by Vermeer and which painting is by a different artist. The painting we're going to discuss today is Vermeer's St. Praxitus from 1655, the earliest existing painting that we have from Vermeer. And to add to the confusion about whether or not it's a real Vermeer like all the others, it's actually a copy of a painting by the Italian painter Felice Ficciarelli. Ficciarelli's St. Praxis painting was created between 1640 and 1645, so a good decade before Vermeer's painting. I'll have side-by-side photographs of them on BillionDollarPodcast.com. They both depict St. Praxitus, a 2nd century Roman saint whose primary claim to fame, if you are to believe Catholic.org, is helping Christians during the persecutions and for having been from a family of saints. Her father is St. Pudens, her sister is St. Pudentiana, and her brothers are St. Novatius and St. Timothy. So there is another holy family right there. The two paintings are very similar in almost every respect the pose of St. Praxitus, and the colors in particular. St. Praxitus is seen wearing a pink and white gown, kneeling and wringing out a bloody sponge into an ornate vessel. And when I say similar, I really do mean similar. Vermeer made almost no attempt to differentiate his version from Ficciarelli, probably because, if it's an actual Vermeer, Vermeer was asked by a patron, with probably a copy of... Ficciarelli's work right there, or the original, to paint this. 
Maybe because their styles were already so similar, maybe just because the patron liked the work and wanted to make sure that he had one as well. The only real difference between the two canvases is that Vermeer has given St. Praxidus a cross to hold in addition to the bloody sponge in her hands. It seems almost like a kind of clumsy addition for a person whose hands are already full to also have this kind of cross stuck in there at an odd angle. So maybe it was an afterthought or a request from a picky patron, who's to say? The St. Praxitus painting appears to have two signatures, one which says Mir 1655 and one that says Mir N-R-O-O, which might have been translated to Vermeer after Riposo, since Riposo was one of Ficciarelli's pen names. In both cases, it's important to remember that in Dutch, Johan Vermeer is more commonly written as Johannes van der Meer, hence the Meer as a kind of shorthand for it. Because Vermeer's name wasn't notable during the 18th and early 19th centuries, provenance of his artworks is usually pretty lacking. If you read about the 34 paintings that are more concretely attributed to Vermeer today, a few similarities keep popping out. They often have no provenance before the 19th century. They're formally attributed to other artists, and the new attribution to Vermeer is based on similarities in style to Vermeer's existing body of work. Similarly, if you keep reading about Vermeer, there are all kinds of speculation about the so-called lost paintings. People wonder, for example, why he didn't paint more specifically Catholic works, St. Praxidus being kind of an example of a saint painting that we would expect to see. Further, where are the traditionally styled portraits that must have sustained him as a career painter? Surely, if he created about 50 works in his lifetime, some of them ought to be out there, right? And this kind of seems like a sticky situation. If you're basing whether or not a painting by supposedly Johann Vermeer is similar based on other paintings that it might be similar to, well, you've got yourself a big problem there. It's a house of cards that can pretty easily start tumbling down. And it seems like a sticky situation, almost like someone could take advantage of all of this mystery. And let me tell you about a man who did just that. Han van Meeren was born in 1889 in Deventer in the Netherlands. His father was a distant figure who forbade him from studying art, and so the young van Meeren turned to the painter Bartus Kordeling as a kind of surrogate father figure and artistic mentor. It just so happened that Kordeling was a fan of the old Dutch master Johannes Vermeer, who had been discovered just a few decades prior, and he used Vermeer's artwork to teach van Meeren some of the primary techniques of painting. Van Meeren attended an art school in The Hague in the Netherlands beginning in 1913, and he quickly gained fame there. He won a few awards from the Technical University in Delft for his painting Study of the Interior of the Church of St. Lawrence. He married Anna de Vogt, another art student, in spring of 1912. But a few awards wasn't enough to keep a family going, especially not when the artistic elite in the Netherlands became infatuated with the new vogues of modernism and thought of his classically inspired artworks as trite and lacking depth. It wasn't uncommon to see reviews of his shows from this time period. You can read that they call him a good draftsman, but not a great artist, and he really took this to heart. Von Meeren took up teaching and painting Christmas cards and other assorted commercial artworks to keep his family going. He became a relatively successful portrait artist and was able to travel Europe to find work among the elite of Italy, France, Belgium, and England. But when his wife sued for divorce in 1923, he threw himself into another valuable art trade, forgery. Throughout the 1920s, while living in The Hague, what a popular guidebook of the day called The City of Beautiful Nonsense, Van Meeren began to paint in the styles of the Dutch masters, especially Frans Hals, Peter de Hoosh, and Johan Vermeer. In 1932, Van Meeren began to pursue what he called the perfect forgery. He moved in with his new wife, the actress Johanna Theresa Orlemans, in the south of France and began production on his very own Vermeer. The subject of the painting was the supper at Emmaus. Art historical knowledge at that time said that Vermeer must have studied in Italy. This is no longer thought to be the case, but it was at the time. And so Van Meeren chose a version of the supper at Emmaus by Caravaggio as the model for his artwork. He attempted to paint it with the closest approximation to 17th century techniques that he could manage. 
He used 17th century canvases, used pigments that were available to the Dutch master and mixed them himself, and made his own badger hair paintbrushes. He also then attempted to age the paintings using phenol formaldehyde, also called Bakelite, which had made the painting crack and age almost as if it were almost 300 years old. The test was getting the painting in front of an expert, so he listed his friend C.A. Boone, a lawyer with a spotless reputation who could never be thought of as a fraudulent dealer, to present the painting to Dr. Abraham Bredius. Bredius, a notable art historian himself, pronounced the supper a genuine Vermeer. The painting was then purchased by the Rembrandt Society, with assistance from Willem van der Morm, a shipping magnet, who promptly donated it to a museum in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. The final price was 520,000 guilders, which translates roughly to $5.2 million today. Not bad for a forgery. Van Meeren continued to make forgeries of Dutch masters throughout the 1930s, including two fake Peter de Hooch paintings that were pretty well received by the artworks that he continued to pawn off through his uh, various art dealers. During the later 1930s and early 1940s, he earned around 5.5 to 7.5 million guilders, that's 25 to 30 million dollars today, but he spent it just as quickly as he earned it. He owned over 50 homes, primarily in the Netherlands, in the Dutch states, and in France. He had countless jewels, and he had many genuine old masters. He also drank heavily and became a morphine addict, which made the quality of his work waver significantly. The Nazi Germans occupied the Netherlands in the spring of 1940. Avon Miren, called forgery of Johannes Vermeer, called Christ with the Adulteress, was sold to a Nazi official, Alois Madel, in 1942. Then Madel sold it to fellow Nazi official Hermann Göring, who we also met in the episode about Vincent van Gogh's portrait of Dr. Gachet. Goring had been angling for a Vermeer after Adolf Hitler had required two Vermeer paintings, The Allegory of Painting and The Astronomer. The Astronomer was actually Hitler's favorite artwork out of the thousands that he owned, and he planned to make it a centerpiece of the museum that he would create in his hometown. Unlike the Van Gogh, Goring's Vermeer didn't just get funneled out of Goring's hands through the Nazi art dealers to raise money for the Reich, but rather stayed at his private residence in Karenhall. You see, Nazis loved Vermeer. The Nazi love for Vermeer is part of a two-sided coin of Nazi cultural identity. We've talked before on this podcast about how Nazis did not like what they called degenerate art, especially modernism and surrealism, which they thought was aligned with decadence, socialism, homosexuality, and of course, Jewishness. Adolf Hitler, of course, was a former art student, and an entire chapter of Mein Kampf confronts what he saw as the evils of modernism and the Dada, or absurdist, movement. The Nazis had a sense of what's called Volksgeist, the character of a people, and they attempted to safeguard what they thought of as the Northern European Volksgeist by destroying degenerate art and promoting art appropriate to an Aryan master race. Vermeer's quiet domestic scenes recalled the ideal Aryan nuclear family and, in a broader extent, the ideal Germanic Northern European history and past, the good old days for the Nazis. His people were religious, his women beautiful, men intelligent. The fact that von Muren was copying Vermeer's at this point in history raises a lot of questions. Historians' interpretations of this really do begin to differ. Was von Muren a misunderstood genius hoodwinking one of the most terrible empires the world has ever seen? Or was he a Nazi sympathizer? Or was he just kind of an immoral sleazeball trying to make money? Goring had to hide his treasured fake Vermeer along with a large trove of artworks in a salt mine in Austria. The entire lot was discovered by the Allied forces and identified by monuments men, Monumentsman was the title that was given to a special branch of the Allied forces, really just kind of a task force, that who were tasked with the preservation and restitution of Nazi looted artworks. It was the Monuments men who traced the Vermeer back to Madel and then to von Muren, who was promptly arrested. 
Von Mieren kept up a cheery face throughout the trial, even though he was faced with imprisonment and a lifetime professional ban from painting for aiding and abetting the enemy. Then, further details came to light. Von Mieren's Christ with the Adulterer, the painting that made its way into Goring's hands, was inspired by the German Nazi artist Hans Schoninger's painting Ostmark Peasant Family. Ostmark Peasant Family depicts an Austrian Nazi soldier being bid farewell by his family, and von Mieren's figures copy the Austrian painting almost exactly. All the figures are in the same places, but tellingly he has changed the central figure of the Nazi soldier to Jesus Christ. No wonder this painting appealed so strongly to the Nazis. It was a rustic German take on Christian religion. Then it came out that von Mieren was a devotee early in his life to prominent art journalist Camille Mauclair, who wrote constantly about the failings of modernism and lamented the fact that the stylistic principles that had been supported and pioneered by the old masters were now largely disregarded. This was probably the common ground that he and von Mieren shared, a kind of artistic conservatism rooted in a belief of a more pure artistic past, but conservatism turned to revolutionary politics, and Mauclair was soon steeped in Nazism and anti-Semitic cultural discourse. So he was guilty by association. Most damningly, von Mieren created a folio of drawings that he dedicated to Adolf Hitler. During his trial, von Mieren attempted to say that he had merely created the folio and that an unidentified German officer had written the dedication and sent it to the Führer, but the handwriting expert consulted by the court dismissed this claim outright. It had to be from Van Mieren. But still, Van Mieren wasn't universally hated at the time of his trial, as hard as that is to believe. People in the Netherlands at the time, now a year after liberation from Nazi rule, were really burned out. That first year had been full of a kind of anti-collaborationist hunt. They were really out looking for people who may have helped the Nazis in any capacity. And it's worth remembering that, although some people don't like to admit it, people really did sometimes just duck their head down or try to get along or try to get ahead with the Nazi rule. And so there were quite a few of them that now that they were free, the people of the Netherlands really wanted to root out. And that had lasted for about a year. But after a year, they'd seen enough. They had these long, unending trials trudge through their battered legal system. Really, the Nazi occupation had left the Netherlands government with a kind of travesty on their hands. And they weren't really up to logistically or culturally dealing with the kind of slog of, the, of dealing with all the Nazi collaborators. So it was more convenient to cast von Mieren as a kind of rascal who had hoodwinked the Nazis, a sort of charming Robin Hood figure. And you'll see this kind of attitude even today. If a high-profile forgery case comes to light, you can look in almost any comment section and find several posts saying things like, serve those rich folks right for wasting the money. People who can't relate to the expensive world of art like art forgers, even if art historians find them consternating, to say the least. Von Mieren, ever the opportunist, took advantage of this and played into his public hero persona. He was charming, in the courtroom he was funny, he really wanted to make sure that he didn't possibly get a lifetime ban. Much of this account is told in the book The Man Who Made Vermeers, which is a fabulous book by Jonathan Lopez that I highly recommend. According to Lopez, quote, in the end, no professional ban against Van Muren was ever announced because the forger, with his characteristically perfect sense of the moment, died before it could happen. As a result, Van Muren's public image remained frozen in time, just as charming as it was on the day of his trial, and the tale of the misunderstood genius who fooled the world was left to take on a life of its own, its meaning mutable, its symbolic importance open to divergent interpretations." Unquote. So what does this mean for St. Praxitus, our Johannes Vermeer? I once joked to a friend that Vermeer is a social construct, and I'll explain what I mean by that. While there was definitely a man called Johannes Vermeer, he existed, he was a painter, he made some artworks that we know of, his legend and status as the Sphinx of Delft, or one of the modern masters of light or anything like that, is a new invention. 
It's so difficult to tell which artworks are his, and while I agree that some of the paintings that are attributed to him are beautiful, many of them are not very different from any of the paintings that were being created by his contemporaries. Again, check the show notes on the website if you don't believe me how similar paintings between him and his contemporaries really are. This is part of what I think makes Vermeer actually a very likely candidate for a billion-dollar artist. His artworks are extremely rare, very rarely do they come for auction. Most of them are in museums around the world, he has a huge name in the art world. But there is quite a lot of wiggle room for a clever forger or archivist to contrive a painting to be a Vermeer. And as long as enough experts get the Vermeer feeling, whatever that is, from a painting, it. what I say is that it has been done before, and it could happen again. For us, this means that St. Praxidus is in a sticky situation here. The earliest known record of it is during a sale in New York in 1943, when it was collected by Jacob Rader. Not a terribly auspicious time period for a Vermeer to show up, I'm sure you'll agree. Its authenticity has been debated since then, as it passed through various hands, including the art dealer Spencer Samuels in 1969, the Barbara Piaseca Johnson Collection Foundation in 1987, and most recently to an unknown buyer at a Christie's auction in 2014 for $10 million. Christie's, of course, assembled a auction catalog that it says convincingly proves Vermeer that he created it and proves its provenance. But naturally, an auction house with a stake in the winnings isn't always trustworthy by all of the experts in this regard. Since 2015, St. Praxidus has been on long-term loan to the National Museum of Western Art in Tokyo, where it is labeled, quote, attribution to Johannes Vermeer. For paintings we discuss on this podcast, $10 million is pretty low, and the low price is probably because of its disputed attribution. So, what's a collector to do? Clearly, as you can tell from the recent self of the Salvatore Mundi attributed to Leonardo da Vinci, a complete consensus of authorship isn't really needed for an artwork to break records, provided the painting has some kind of provenance that suggests it beyond a reasonable doubt. Like Leonardo, Vermeer has so few paintings that come up for sale that it would be almost unheard of for a new one to come up, and so many collectors would consider taking the leap if there was enough backing to it. For St. Praxidus to have its reattribution completely affirmed, a few things would need to happen. The painting would need to have a more sophisticated chemical authentication process completed to make sure that it's the right time and place, for Johannes Vermeer to have created it. There would also need to be some sort of evidence to come up that Vermeer completed a St. Praxis painting during his lifetime, or that he visited Italy, or that the St. Praxis by Ficciarelli made its way into Delft for Vermeer to see it. The similarities between the two are too close to suggest that Vermeer could have seen merely a sketch or an etching of the painting. I also don't think a more thorough dig into von Muren's story to find if he's ever painted a St. Praxidus in the style of Vermeer would go amiss. If all of this happens, and the evidence suggests that St. Praxidus must be a Johannes Vermeer, I wouldn't be entirely surprised if St. Praxidus became the first billion dollar painting. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe and leave a five-star review. It helps more people find their way to the show. You can also find more information about St. Praxidus and other works of art by visiting the website, BillionDollarPodcast.com. You can tweet at us, at Billion Painting. Follow our Instagram, at the Billion Dollar Painting, Or you can email us at TheBillionDollarPainting at gmail.com. See you next week.